Um, nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, well, I'm delighted to introduce um, Tom Papinski, who's going to share his um, great stores of AAS wisdom with us tonight. Um, Tom Papinski teaches in the government department at Cornell, and he's also the director of the Cornell Southeast Asia program. His research focuses primarily on maritime Southeast Asia in the fields of political economy and comparative politics. He's currently in his spare time trying to complete a book about identity that he's been thinking about since 2005. And this year will be the 16th time that Tom has attended AAS. The first time was in 2008 in Atlanta. And he hopes to share with you today what he wished he knew back then. So we have a few minutes, we'll hear from Tom and then we'll have plenty of time um, for questions. And at least at the moment, we're a small enough group that we can sort of open it up and be a, a more casual conversation. Um, so take it away, Tom, enlighten us. Great, thanks MK. Uh, and it's nice to see you all. Uh, my, uh, as MK mentioned, my name is Tom Papinski, and I teach in the government department at Cornell, and I'm the director of the Southeast Asia program. Um, and so what this means is that I've had a lot of experience going to professional conferences in my day. Um, my first AAS, uh, as MK mentioned, was in Atlanta in 2008. It was entirely foreign to me. Uh, I approached the event with some trepidation and uh, I didn't really have much of an exposure to Asian studies as a discipline when I when I when I decided to go, and that's much of how I've of what I've learned. I've learned through either the conference itself or through the connections I've made there. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is to share with you all um, what I wish that I knew back then about how to navigate AAS as a not not necessarily only as a first time participant or a first time attendee, but I think this will be most relevant if this is kind of like entirely uh, a novel experience to you. So I'll get started. I'll talk for about five to seven minutes, um, and then we'll turn it over uh, to to you all for questions. Um, I think because we're a small enough group, uh, we could probably just identify ourselves and and go that way. But if we get more people coming in here, we can make things. Uh, we can we can organize things in a more formal way. So okay, so what I wish I understood about AAS um, as an as a meeting, and my role as somebody attending it, is that AAS at a macro level is a fairly confusing and very large organization, but the experience of the conference that I have come to understand is actually very very small. In my field of Southeast Asian politics, there is maybe 50 to 75 people total who come to the conference, and that's 50 to 75 out of thousands and thousands of people. And it's it's small enough, that little community, that we sort of kind of move from room to room en masse. You know, it's not all the time that we're going from the same place, but it's a fairly self-contained little group. And I think that what my experience was made more difficult by sort of, I just showed up and just like tried to do it and, and hadn't given it much thought about how to, how to identify my friends or my community or how, or how to make things work. So the, what I'd like to talk to you about is what my, some of my guesses are about concerns that you might have, or if you've been to a conference before, maybe some experiences that you've had or some feelings that you've had while, while attending that and then talk about the ways uh, that I have tried to manage those and, and turn them in the directions that I want. So my, uh, my three main uh, reactions to uh, AAS the first time that I attended were the following. It felt very daunting, felt like there was a lot that was gonna happen um, that I didn't know, and I, it a swirl of information, so many things to do, so many panels that I could attend, so many receptions that were out there. Um, so it felt daunting. It also felt anonymous. It felt like I didn't know any, I knew for sure that I would know like two people who I corresponded with who would be there, but I wasn't going to spend my days for the entire conference with these two people. So it felt very much like I was going into a, a social environment where I was one of, thousands and thousands of people. 
and didn't have a lot to didn't have a lot in common with them. And so I, the, the, I experienced that as a, a kind of, it, I anticipated this with a little bit of dread, like, like I would be, I would feel anonymous. I'd feel lonely. I wouldn't know where to go. go I wouldn't know who to talk to. And the other thing is in a very non-specific way, but clearly I remember thinking this, uh, AAS felt consequential. Like I had to do, like I, I needed to do something there. I needed to use AAS in some fashion, or if I didn't do AAS right in some capacity, I would miss out on something, right? So, so the the emotions that I felt uh, when I was planning to go, and then certainly for the first time I went, were that like there seems like a lot of the stuff that's going on. I don't really know anybody here or feel I feel connected to the people around me, and I I wor I was worrying about missing something like there was something that was there that I didn't I didn't know what to do or I would if I didn't do the right thing I'd somehow miss it, and that's an that's a recipe for like a fairly unpleasant conference experience right, like, you know everything feels like a big deal and I never to talk to about it, um, and what I've learned since is that uh, AAS can be all of those things. Like any professional organization, it can be all of those things. It can be daunting. It can be anonymous and it can be consequential. Um, but there's, there's, there's a kind of safety in numbers because that is the dominant feeling that most of us have. Like a lot of us, especially when we're first starting out are in, are in roughly the same boat. We are, we are early in our careers, so early in our careers that we don't have networks that we can rely on to get us things. Um, we're early in our careers. And so the decisions that we make seem like they might be consequential. Like I better give a good presentation. I better, I better impress the people who might be there. I don't know who's going to be there, but here's a big name that might be there. Maybe I should do the right thing. Um, and, you know, I'll, as early career scholars, we are all trying to find our place in this organization. So the idea that there's so much going on, it, that is what all of us think about. Like, and so as you become more accustomed to participating in AAS, uh, you learn to manage those things, but they never really go away. And they never really can because it's a big organization. So the way that I recommend that you manage some of the, the uncertainties and the challenges that come with uh, joining and attending AES for the first time is to is to do a couple things, um, uh, and then after I go over these things, I'll 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 just give a reflection and then open it up for some questions. The first thing is I would just uh, you know I would sit down and look in a mirror and say like everybody around me is feeling roughly the same thing as I am, and. I, I don't want to, I don't mean to like hype yourself up, but like, I think it's very important to recognize that people's conference personas, like in the, in the moment of standing in the lobby or making their way from room to room are not their real personas. So they are busy um, and they are intentional and they look like they have things to do, but that is partially to fill up the dead space. That is partially to make sure that we have some reason to be there. It AS is expensive. It takes a lot of time. You have to spend a lot of time there. It doesn't. It doesn't feel pleasant to just mill about. And so, uh, you know, you you will find all you surround. You find yourself surrounded by people who look like they know what they're doing. They look like they have some purpose. They look like they're busy and they look like they're intentional. And most of the time, they're basically in the same boat as you. They would like to talk to you if you know them. They would like to. Uh, to you know, grab a beer or a coffee if, if that's if there's something that would be amenable to you, or they're just going through the same kind of like find myself here, find my place here, um, uh, as as others do. So th that's kind of like reassuring. Second thing is you know take some time with the program and plan your day. You can do this in advance. Um, all the information is out there. There's there's always a panel you can go to that's interesting. Uh, there's always a panel that can go to you can go to that's that's useful. Um, and so do that. And then also plan your day. Like if you have if you don't know anybody at all, then you, there's nobody to to email to to arrange uh, uh, coffees or anything like that with. But if there are even a handful of friends or former mentors or people from other programs, field work friends, faculty from your own institutions, you don't feel shy about emailing people and saying, hey, do you got, do you want to meet for a coffee at 4.30 or maybe not coffee at 4.30, but maybe do you want to meet for a, 
for a decaf at, at 4.30 or do you want to meet for a, uh, for a, a breakfast or something like that? So, you know, basically construct a schedule that allows you to have places to go and things to do so that you don't find yourself milling about as I often did, kind of wondering what I was doing there and like, what is my place there? Um, and then the third thing to do is uh, if you're, I mean, and this is the part where consequential comes out, comes in there. Um, in my discipline of political science, people tend to outsmart themselves and overemphasize things that aren't exactly right. So you may have heard people say things like every talk is a job talk. Have you heard that before? Um, that is the type of thing that people say in political science circles. I, I'm here to tell you that is not true. So your presentation is not the most important thing that you will ever do. It's not the most important thing that will ever happen to you. But you do want to, you know, find find yourself a, a bit of quiet time to prepare before it, uh, it happens. Make sure if you're an introvert uh, or somebody who needs, like uh, I was meeting with Thamora just before I talked today and I had to I had to beg my leave from Thamora because I need, I need 15 minutes to hype myself up before I teach. I really need to get into the right headspace. And so that may be you. And, and so think about giving yourself the tools and resources to be able to make your way through the conference effectively. Um, and if that means doing a presentation, give yourself some space, really prepare, think hard about that. Um, and then with the remaining uh, time that you have, uh, think about how you can enjoy the experience rather than making it uh, this like daunting, daunting, anonymous and consequential experience. And you may enjoy the conference by finding something else to do that has nothing to do with the conference that is in the city where it happens to be. So as we were discussing previously, to my horror, AAS is happening in Boston on St. Patrick's Day. So there, there may be things that you can do that are not conference related that give you a break from things. You may have friends who want to get together to do things. And so you can have the chance to, to find some of these friends and get together. And, and you know, uh, I, I've done things like go to, uh, uh, in LA, I've gone to LACMA, the art museum, instead of doing a panel because I needed a little bit of time. I wanted to see something. Um, in Chicago, I've been to a baseball game. I'm not particularly a baseball fan, but like it's a thing to do. And it was, they had the, there was one there at the time. And and it it could also be like you know you you find some some friend and you just go for a little walk together and see the city or see some part you hadn't seen before. Um, there's really there's really nothing that can substitute for you know feeling comfortable. But what I want what I want you to leave today's presentation with, if nothing else, is the is the following: like the the anxiety or anticipation you have for the conference is entirely normal, and not only normal, it is entirely common among the people around you. Uh, and even if nobody else will talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. It is normal, it is common. You will find others uh, having situations like this. And this, uh, the, the interactions that happen there are not the end of the world. They are nice opportunities. Um, you can think about, uh, if you guys wanna talk about things like networking or, um, you know, how to navigate the book exhibition or other things that can happen at a conference. I'm happy to tell you about those things. But the main thing that I want to give you is a little bit of confidence that there's, that you are not unlike most people around you and the work that you're doing will have value. And as you get to, as you get to uh, have a little bit more experience with this group, and as you get to meet more people uh, across the, the years uh, that you attend, Sooner or later, AAS will actually feel like a vacation. So at my stage, uh, I, I know I'm going to see a bunch of people I know who I haven't seen in a long time, and it's going to be pleasant in that way. Um, but you only get there after you go through the, the hard yards of, of getting started. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll make sure that I stop now so that we can get some questions in here. Um, but I hope to have... I hope to have like given you a little bit of a voice about how you might be concerned about how conferences work. Um, and then the nitty gritty stuff, I'm happy to respond to any questions that you have. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Tom. That was really helpful. Um, I know personally, I'm going to my first AAS this year in person. Last year, I participated virtually um, and I have to say, I, I didn't get anything out, uh, out of it as a virtual participant. Um, it was 
kind of sad. <laughs> um, so I'm excited to try it in person. Um, but I sort of to pick up on one of the last things you said, I wonder if you might um, sort of give us your sense of what, you know, in this time when it's so easy to connect with people on Zoom and do things virtually, what is the real benefit of getting thousands of people together in the same place? Is how, how different is it? Or, you know, like, what do you think is the big thing, the big takeaway for uh, doing these kinds of conferences? That's a great question. Um, and let me try to, to give you a couple answers, um, none of which are gonna be completely satisfactory. Um, but it, it's food for thought. The first thing to say is that I don't think tech can save us from our need to commune with other people. I just don't think we can do it. Like it can, it can make some things like what we're doing right now possible. Um, but like, it's just, it's just not the same. And I, I don't have words for how it's not the same. But there's something tangible. Like I would love nothing more than to have this conversation with all of you here around a table so that we could we could get pick up on co on context clues we could see one another we could ask after one another we could get a sense of we could get a sense of how we are in the real world um and so the online scenario just doesn't work the reason why that is i think so digging one le level deeper is because you don't have to pay attention on your computer in the same way you have to pay attention in a room right and look i know my crippling internet addiction also makes it hard for me to pay attention to things. Zooms are really hard. All of my work is on the other side of this window in front of me. All of, you know, I get text messages on this computer. I get all my emails in here. My book is on the other side. So like, I know how hard it is to pay attention. There is no substitute for the feeling of being in a space with one another. And it's very different so let me just do something. Let me just check my email. So I'm checking my email right now. It's very different to do that, right? So I just did it. I just checked my email versus sitting in a room and doing this, right? It's just not the same. You have to have, like we expect a level of contact and attention with one another when we're in person that makes us, makes those interactions real. So that's why the computer can't do it uh, the same way. But there are downsides. There's a huge carbon cost. I don't know how, we're only having this conversation as a discipline now, but the carbon cost of this is just unbelievable. There's the access costs, right? People are gonna fly, getting to Boston from overseas is not easy. Um, I mean, maybe from Ireland, there are lots of flights, but if you're coming from Asia, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be a difficult uh, process. And those who are there from, for, who have traveled a long way are gonna be not only have it, they, well, not only will they have faced higher costs to do it, they will also be jet lagged and like more not in their comfort space than someone like me who's just going to drive for six hours in the you know, same time zone, no big deal. I'll sleep. I'll sleep just the same. So you know, I think that the the ability to pull somebody aside and have a coffee with them it really m makes a difference. The ability to see how people ask questions in person really makes a difference. The ability to 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 like to really focus on people makes a difference, and I think that's why in-person conferences really are different. It's a real different experience. That's great. I also a had lot, the experience a lot of, to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, I also had the experience, I should say, of having intended online conferences and being like, "This is awful. This is just garbage." Um, well, with this um, mood in, in mind of the conversation around the table, I just want to invite folks, um, if you want to ask a question, you can just turn your video on and, you know, it's just, what, like 10 of us or so. Um, so let's try to make it a casual conversation. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking my questions. Um, <laughs> So feel free to, to unmute, to turn your video on, or uh, to drop a question in the chat also. Um, and uh, while people are, uh, oh, please, yes, go ahead. So hi, everyone. I'm zooming in from Vancouver, Canada, so on the West Coast. But um, I had a quick question about networking. Um, as a junior scholar, and this is my first big conference, I was just wondering, how do you get how do you approach somebody to just get to know them, especially when 
I think for a lot of us, we spend so much time reading about these people and then meeting them in person. There's that kind of surreal moment of like, oh, they're actually more than just, you know, an author for a book. I'm, yeah, I was just wondering if you had any tips on how to approach that. Or whether like there's like a formality around it, whether we should email them beforehand or whether we can just stop in our tracks and say hi to somebody at a conference. That's a great question. And my my answer is going to be a little long. So I'm going to apologize in advance because um, there's a couple of things going on uh, that I think it's wor worthwhile talking to talking through. First off, I want to make sure I actually at answer your question. Um, if you want to get on somebody's schedule, email before the conference starts. That's the way to do it. And it's completely fine to cold email somebody and say, somebody you want to meet, somebody you'd like to spend some time with, somebody whose work you've read. Uh, it's completely fine. And the best way to make sure that you get that time is to send them an email in advance, uh, announce a time, see if they're free, or like a window, see if they'd like to meet with you. Um, and and like start that way. I. I receive email. I used to send those emails. And now I receive those emails, and that's that. That is the easiest way. It's the best way to do it. Um, however, so that's that's what you should do. Not everybody will respond to those emails, though. And one of the hardest things, and I still struggle with this when I interact with other people, is to remember that people, some people are actually really don't like conferences because they don't like the thing that you're describing. And that includes often very senior people who find they they will often pretend or they will they will maybe not want to make a deal out of it. But I know a number of senior scholars in my field of political science who actually abhor that kind of interaction. And so they they are it's because they're they're introverts and because they're because they, they they find that sort of interaction to be too scripted and like too formal it's just too hard for them so what that means the reason why i say this is like if you want to get on somebody's schedule that's how you do it at the same time some people will not want to respond and it's not your fault that's not your responsibility it's never inappropriate i don't think it's ever inappropriate and those of you, I think we should, you should raise your hands at, or type in the chat if you disagree. I think it's ever inappropriate to email somebody and ask. The worst they can say is no, um, but it will never be inappropriate to have asked. But the other thing that you're talking about is like the person that you want to meet, but you didn't know you wanted to meet them until you saw them, right? You didn't know they were going to be there. You didn't know that you were going to hear what they had to say and you'd, you'd, it'd turn you on. Um, and then you have this, this kind of awkward sense of like, I want to approach them and say hello. Uh, and it feels like that will create a connection and it might, but it's not, it's not clear what the, what, what, what comes out of that, if that, if you know what I mean. Uh, that's the reason why I said that, that my, uh, um, uh, my comments are going to be long is like, I don't, I don't think everybody means the same thing by networking. I think that networking can mean a couple of things. One of which is like, deliberately going and making sure that one establishes a personal connection and a face-to-face, -face, like like people, two, two people know each other with scholars that you that, that you know about. The other could be um, finding yourselves in situations where, where you in, are in a sort of more casual or social relationship with people in which you are not, it's not one-on-one, -on -one, but you're in a small group and you're talking, maybe you're having a coffee together, maybe you're grabbing a drink together, or maybe you're just walking through the halls and having a little conversation. The 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 like get people to to notice who you are i think is a lot harder and a lot more uncomfortable than treating the, these as opportunities to speak to people um in small groups or casually so your place to do that is in the panel right with others um it takes a little bit of i don't want to say bravery but it takes a little bit of gumption sometimes to put yourself out there so like that's that's the the milieu in which that makes a lot of sense, in which that's easy to do. Another thing are section receptions. And so you might have a small group like the Indonesia Timor Leste Studies Group ha sometimes has a reception. That's a place to do it. If you know people who go to specific receptions, you might want to attend and go find them there. That's a smaller and more like socially like organized for socialization type of uh, experience. And and that's I think the way that I find it to happen uh, most easily. But like to 
to answer your question, if you told me go network, it would be very uncomfortable for me. It's hard. That's not the natural way that we relate to one another. It's a, it's a relationship which is both personal and transactional. And what we want is that personal relationship to dominate and have transactional consequences later on. But the, the kind of the social milieu of the conference like, encourages these like brief, intense types of interactions, which I, I, they're, they're, they're sort of unsatisfying. So to close, what is a very long answer to your question, and I hope it's been useful, is you know, if there's somebody you really need to meet and you really want to meet, email is the best way to do it. Don't, don't, be, don't get your feelings hurt. Um, if they don't respond, some people just don't do that sort of thing. Um, but also when it comes to the the like the the, the task of building your network, um, I think that a, a good way to to get your expectations aligned is to think about if I can have a nice conversation with somebody briefly without it being uh, without there being like an outcome that I'm looking for, but rather just to know that person and to introduce yourself, that that is plenty. Like the, the networking itself doesn't have the returns that we want it to. It's that feeling of sociality, that feeling of, of having a connection. And that is like, that is your network only in the, like, in like a five-year time horizon, not like you don't build a network now. It's like, that's the thing that eventually you'll come back to. And I can tell you, uh, and, 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 and this may seem impossible, but like you will, you will meet people at AAS the first time that you will not think you've left an impression on. And then the next year you will see them again and you will have left an impression even if you hadn't wanted to, which is, which is good. That's how that network builds. Thank you so much for that answer. Sure. Um, so as the question in the chat is sort of a, a follow-up, I think just looking for any more advice on pitching or introducing yourself to strangers, especially to very senior people at a conference? Yes. So uh, I'll, I'll expand a little bit on like on that specific form of interaction because it's important. It's a thing that we do, and it's important. It's a it's a moment that you will find yourselves in uh, 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 at some point in time. Um, so the hardest thing about this is, is like, what do you want? The, the question to ask yourself is, what do you want out of this interaction? Um, and I, it, the, the pitch or introduction is often, it's often done without, it, it becomes important because you think some, you need something out of this interaction, but it can be a little bit, um, a little bit hard from your counterpart to know, you know, what, what is wanted. And I, you know, my experience is that people don't want these interactions to be transactional in nature. They want, they want them to be, you know, personal in, 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 in nature, like somebody who's interested in you and wants to hear about you. Um, and so what I, what I often think of is that um, many times Introducing yourself to a to a scholar is not necessary, right? The, the it is sometimes not clear what that is for. Um, I'm I imagine somebody who has you know thirty years of experience in the field, who's been around, done lots of things. Um, you know that person could be as kind and friendly and approachable as possible. And that person probably just has a busy schedule that they're trying to get through and a mind which is preoccupied by like, are the kids getting to soccer practice? Did I arrange that? Like just sort of like when I'm, when I'm in a uh, conference, but there's like just a lot of things happening. So I often think that if you want somebody to know you, it's better to email them with something with a question. So like, so I, I think the email is the way to get, get yourself on somebody's list, you know, not everybody responds, but also, you know, if you want to, if you want somebody to read your work, something you can do, I think very nicely is you can introduce yourself and ask to, if it's okay to send a paper or a chapter to that person. Like that's a, that is a conversation that has a function, has an endpoint, and allows the person to say yes Right. The counterpart can say yes and say that's that's a thing to do. But the expectation isn't 
in that interaction for much more than that. Yeah, there'll be a little bit of small talk perhaps, but you're not looking for something beyond that. If there's somebody who has something that like the, the purpose of the meeting or the or this the, this connection is like because that person has access to resources, so let's say grant money or a job or you know uh, postdoc opportunities, things like that, that that's a different type of interaction. And that's also one that I think you want to schedule via email. If if that's if talking to that specific person is important as much as possible, try to make that an an email introduction that you plan a time to say hello, because otherwise, you will you will see. For this is a stylized interaction. The panel concludes. People in the audience stand up. The people on the panel sort of stand up. They talk to one another. The people mill about. Everybody's trying to get out of there. And that's when you have, that's when people want to come say hello, right? Like that's, it's just a really difficult moment to have a meaningful interaction. And even somebody who really wants to can oftentimes find themselves just like, yeah, I I can't be in the in the mental headspace in this moment to, to give you the attention that I want to give you. So instead you start with the email saying, I'm going to say hello afterwards. And then that interaction can just be, I just wanted to say, hi, is it okay if I send you something? Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. I really liked your question, something basic like that. And then that's all it has to be. Anita, I see you, but I'm going to call on Arif to see if they have a follow-up for Tom about their question. Hi, um, this is Arif. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't open my uh, video. Um, I have one follow-up question on the thing that you just said. I mean, um, coming from Germany, it's uh, the German culture is very direct and very blunt. I'm just wondering whether there is any uh, intercultural nuances that I should be aware of, of conferences in America. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> and it has the most complicated possible answer, which is the following. Not only are there certainly intercultural nuances that you want to keep in mind, but like conference mode is not even normal American mode. So it doesn't even, like telling you how Americans normally are is not very helpful for, for telling you how to behave at a conference or what to expect in a conference. Now let's, Let's make this slightly more complicated. Let's talk about the fact that this is the Asian Studies con Conference. Asia is half of the world's population. It's a big and diverse place. Um, and so the, the, the potential for clash of communication styles in an AAS is enormous. Uh, so what, so I, I just told you it's complicated. What to do about it? Um, if you're an early career scholar, um, what I would do is if there are people you you really need to meet, you really want to get on their schedule, the email is the way to do it. It's not inappropriate at all. Um, you can you guys know how to write respectful emails. And so this isn't hard to do. Um, this isn't a this isn't a big ask. And, and, and you can do this out of uh, with 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 no real with no real trouble. Um, and then just imagine that everybody is out of their element. And in fact, this is this is this is kind of the main thing I want to tell you. Everybody around you who looks like they're in their element is in a very artificial situation that is not their element. And it doesn't matter how confident they're looking, like this is a weird way to spend a couple days. So some so Germans will will have German cultural <laughs> practices that they import with them. And I think you handle that the same way you 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 learned when you arrived in Germany how to how to do that, which is to is to um, is to is to kind of give yourself a little bit of a break, allow yourself to make a mistake or two, try to read the context around you, and also um, I don't I don't I try not to judge anybody for the mistakes they make on dimensions like this. It's just nobody like the norms are so. They're so complicated and, and imprecise in this scenario that if, uh, you know, don't talk over people, don't interrupt them. Um, uh, and you'll, pro you'll probably have done most of what 
uh, American cultural practices you need to do in this sort of situation? But it it's a hard question. It's a really good question. Um, I've my experience is going to conferences in Germany is that they are very different and I stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but I think that perhaps the fact that this is an Asian studies conference in the United States makes a bit, makes things a little bit, uh, there's going to be room for error and we can be generous with each other. Nita, you want to go ahead? Yes. Um, that actually makes me really excited to see the intercultural like communication styles. I hadn't even thought of that. I think it'll be actually interesting. I'm all about leading into awkward moments. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, my question is, I have two questions, one a little more serious and one a little more perhaps superficial. But one is, as a scholar who focused on Southeast Asia specifically, uh, and this is the very broadly named Asian studies conference, how would you recommend navigating that? Do you know, in your experience, is there a difference for students or for scholars that focus on an area like Southeast Asia, which at least from what I've noticed so far, tends to gain less attention than work from like East Asia? Um, so that's sort of my like more academic question. The, the lighter question is, what does one wear? Like, because I know every discipline is a little different. Sociology, my home discipline, we're pretty chill. I hear poli sci is pretty not, so correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but like, so what does one wear to Asian studies conference? It's a great question. The first, the first answer is, um, the thing about AAS is like, I don't, I don't have anything to do with 80% of it. Like I like and and like how could I right? None of you will. None of you possibly could. But basically, I don't. Need, I'm not even looking at panels in East Asia or uh, um, uh, China and Inner Asia, um, Japan, Korea, or South Asia. Like like I might find myself at a panel uh, like that, but I'm not even. I'm not even trying. I'm not even looking. I don't even know. Um, and it is very curious. Nita to to walk around and like see the ways that like Korean studies organizes itself and the way that Southeast Asian studies organizes itself and it it like I, I'm not gonna just like lean into re reconfirmations of stereotypes but like I prefer the Southeast Asian version of things and it is because because Southeast Asia is still somehow peripheral in Asian studies or because we don't have, we have such a diversity of languages, such a diversity of things going on. The country experiences are very, very distinct. We have 11 or I guess we've got maybe seven different country groupings. Um, and so there's just, there's just a lot that, that it sounds like a problem, but it's actually wonderful. That means that we don't, we can't be organized in a hierarchical way in the same way that that the other parts of the Asian studies conference are. We just can't, like, like I probably won't go to, not for lack of interest, but I, I could do just Indonesia and I would be fine. I could do just political science and I would, I would have a full day every day. I could do just Thailand and I have a full day every day. That's actually fine. Um, and I think that you'll find the Southeast Asia fifth of the of the conference to be a little bit more approachable a little bit more fun a little bit more a little bit i think it's i think it's plain less less hierarchical and i don't want to speculate about why i think that or what evidence i have but i like this is i see the more nodding when i say these things like this is very evident right the way that this that the different uh, groups work and and frankly i don't know anything about how the south asia parts of uh, of AS work. It's um, even smaller. They mostly go to a big conference in Madison. Um, so so most of the South Asianists, unless they're on like a border crossing panel, there's there's a very small percentage of their field at, at AAS. Um but, but it's so much is, yeah. I was gonna say what what this means is you you really do if you you really should go to um the country grouping meeting if you can yeah. like you will 
it, it's always shocking to me that people do this because the political science annual meeting is characterized by nobody going to anything. They all just go to the same city and hang out together. But AAS people attend things and people attend those meetings. And if if you're looking for a chance to have a low key conversation with somebody, that's the that's the moment to do it. I it's put that your, in the chat. Yeah, you're oh, great. Thank you, Thamora. It's you're, so much easier now, Nita, to find the Southeast Asia panels because you don't have to read through the whole paper program and like highlight and do sticky like tabs to try to find all the Southeast Asia panels. Now you it's digital, so you can just search and filter and like you know do it by country or by Southeast Asia or but you know like like you can use your digital tools to kind of help you figure out like where your priorities are. So that part is much easier. Um, but yeah. but I would totally agree with Tom that the Southeast Asianists are a little bit more chill and that uh, I, I also said one of the things that's going on with the East Asianists is sometimes people are interviewing for jobs. And so that makes them much more like well-dressed and uptight. <laughs> um, and I think there's also a difference between if you're on a panel versus a day that you're not on a panel in terms of how you dress. So kind of casual, but like you're not like interviewing for jobs. I would say that. And my other bit of advice is no matter where the conference is held, plan for layers because some rooms get like way over air conditioned and others can be stuffy. So like that, like like comfortable layers uh, is really important. And then it really depends on the conference location, how much walking you have to do. Like Hawaii, things are like in all these different locations. And it's going to be so nice to be back in like a single hotel where if you don't want to go outside, you don't have to. It'd be good to get some fresh air, but like, you know, you're just going up and down escalators probably a lot of the time. Um, so that's my that's my advice on the clothing and the the sort of atmosphere. Yeah. Let me add on the clothing thing. Um, there, there's like there's really no rules, um, and uh, and yet I know that like if you feel like you're not dressed like everybody else around you, it can feel very bad. Right? And so, so what's what, what's the guidance that we're looking for here? Now, I uh, I only really know male Western business attire descriptions. <laughs> so like, that's why I jumped yeah, in. Yeah. If you have questions on those, I can tell you exactly what to do. But no, the 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 pattern is I'm I'm going to describe the pattern and then we can talk about what that implies for you. The pattern is most people wear Western business attire at these conferences. Western business attire, uh uh I don't think it's it's ever necessary uh, to wear, if you're a, a man, a tie or a coat. I don't think that's ever necessary. Many people do. I don't think it's you will feel out uh, out of place if you don't. If you do, but most people don't. So most people, any whatever section they're in or whatever region they study, wherever they come from, wherever they live, the 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 default is Western business attire. Um, it's not like the most. It's not semi formal. Uh, it's it's but it's like the level below that and that applies for men and it applies for women and, and then said, there's some people that have have regional flair like jim scott goes around with a shoulder bag from burma on mm -hmm. and Catherine bowie will wear like you know jackets made of you know hill 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 tribe textiles like some people use you know what they're wearing to signal what they study but i would say that that that's less common the younger generation you are and and people are more likely to dress like you know professionally like you want to feel good about yourself right this is to tom's psych, psycho psychoanalyzing what it feels like to be a newbie at one of these conferences so don't wear something you're going to be so uncomfortable in that you're going to be miserable because that will make it a worse experience but like you want to be like putting your best foot forward and feeling like good in your self presentation so like, you know, like it's a, it's like, I think I always dress up more to go to a conference than I do to go to work every day. Does that kind of make sense? It's like, if you're teaching, you probably dress nicer on the days when you're teaching than on the days when you're just sitting in your office working. Right. That's true. <laughs> I'll, I'll note that the, um, 
that the more is absolutely right. There is an inverse correlation between academic stature and formality of dress for sure, which is, which, which screws with you because, you know, the people who have the most resources to dress the nicest are the ones who don't, right? That, and that is, it is unfortunate. Um, or they, you know, but their clothes may be nice, but they're not, you know, Western business uh, uh, attire. Um, that also goes, I often will wear a batik at uh, AAS. I did not wear a batik when I was uh, first starting. Um, and I have like a nice, I have like a business batik that I, that, that I wear. And so that is that is almost certainly um, uh, acceptable um, and, and like, and certainly allowed. Um, there, but let me just say, there's nothing that can get you excluded from the conference. Nothing you could, I mean, if you can go outside in it, you can go to the conference in it. That's for sure. There was somebody, there was somebody at last year's AAS from um, an indigenous community in the uplands of Taiwan who was wearing like her traditional indigenous dress. And at first I was like, oh my God. But then I actually happened to like hear her on a panel later and it was part of her presentation. Like it was very rare that you would see somebody like wearing something related to what they were talking about. But suddenly it all made much more sense because she was actually talking about it as opposed to just wearing that as her conference wear. So, I mean, there's a range of stuff like sometimes and, and the book exhibit don't like don't miss the book exhibit because there's just lots of chances to get a real feel for how publishing works. And kind of, even if you're not like at the stage of your own writing, but if you are like MK, you know, as you're finishing a dissertation, thinking about like where and how you might want to publish, the book exhibit is where you can kind of talk to people who do the acquisitions for different presses and you get a feel for kind of what series they're putting out and, you know, just gather that information. But there's somebody at one of the Japanese booksellers who's in full kimono, like serving, you know, tea in lovely little bowls and you can sit down and have tea with somebody in a kimono. It, it's not the standard thing, but there's like just little like interesting sprinklings of stuff like that going on. So yeah, a nice scar for, you know, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I, I mean, I, I really stressed about this at the beginning because I didn't like, I didn't have, the clothes that I thought I needed. And so I felt like I had to go buy clothes. I wish I had known that it didn't matter, but I also, it, it, there's something different between like what can happen to you if you don't dress the part versus how you will feel about yourself. <clears throat> and so I think about this, I think the more summarized this very nicely. So it's something about, you know, picking the clothes that allow you to, or, or the, the style of dress that allows you to feel like you're, you're not out of place. Uh, and, the de I mean, the default for a for a man would be, you know, khakis and blue shirt. You know, you you can't go that wrong that way, um, and you can modulate that. I think for uh, for other options that you might wear, um, uh, but uh, it's a good question. Um, when you're there, you'll see. And just just as a sociologist, look at the status hierarchies as reflected in dress. Just <laughs> notice how this works. It's like, <clears throat> you know, how many full professors from the Netherlands walk around in Birkenstocks the entire time? You're just going to see it. It's going to be, it's going to be totally clear. Whereas any early career scholar, uh, especially those who are representing their universities, um, uh, early career scholars, especially those who are going with like a superior from uh, from a, a, a traditional university, may dress up more than they need to because they feel the need to look like they belong. Is it true that everyone wears jeans on the last day? If it is, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I didn't know, but I'm gonna start. Um, but people, are, someone people once run, told run me that people wear clothes. jeans on the last day. I, I think people, <laughs> people have been known to like wheel their little rolly luggage to the panels because they're zipping off to the airport, and so it might be that they're not like wearing their nicest clothes because they're about to go catch cab to the plane or you know whatever but i haven't seen a ton of jeans necessarily you know to, it's to probably a little more casual but it's more just because people are like like it's unfortunate to get your your panel put on a sunday because you might be like losing people as they have to travel 
So get your friends to show up. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with telling people like when your panel is and like, you know, Oh yeah. Not, you know, you don't have to pressure people, but just like doing a little bit of promotion of like, you know, just getting, getting it in people's heads. Um, I, I would say that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do. And, you know, if people can't make it, they can't make it. But like the fact that you appreciate them coming to listen is something that um, sometimes makes the difference in like, do I haul myself out of bed an extra half hour early to make it to this thing? Or do I grab my coffee and come listen as opposed to sit at the Starbucks? I had another question, if that's okay. Um, as you mentioned, there's a lot going on, lots of events. I've already gone through, you know, the panels and marks which ones I want and already realized I cannot go to all of them because I will be tired. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's like panels you're interested in, for example, but may not be directly relevant to your research, right? And then there's panels that you think, oh, I think that actually might be relevant to the work that I do. But then also, especially for grad students, I feel there's a lot of like professional development opportunities like the mentoring, um, the mentor program that they set up and things like that. So I'm wondering if you have or had, especially when you were a grad student, like how did you prioritize which events to go to, for example? Like, so I'm deciding between like a mentoring session, for example, that sounds really like a great professional development opportunity, but also there's this panel that just happens to be, I think, pretty relevant to my research. So I'm like, oh, can I just read their articles later? And still go. So how would you prioritize such things? Uh, that's such a great question. Um, let me add another wrinkle. It's like you will be coming from something else and be late to whichever one of those you go to because you'll be too busy talking to people you saw at the last one, right? So so like even best case scenario, it's going to just be hard. Uh, I, I tend to think that, um, so I don't actually know why we have professional conferences at all, where we go and read papers to each other when we could all just read them at home and then talk about them collectively. Um, that's a political science, uh, um, pet peeve that, uh, political scientists are, are always like, why do we have to do any of this? I can read faster than you can talk. So I, if I were in your situation, but this, the answer for me is the mentoring. I do the mentoring because I can't get that anywhere else. That's that's the thing you can't replace, or you can't easily substitute. But I, you know, your mileage is going to vary a little bit on how much that that matters for you. Um, I tend to, I tend to believe that the more important things are are the events that allow you to interact with other people outside of the entirely artificial, uh, like sit in panel you know, stay awake while you're looking at somebody who's reading text to you and then, you know, wait 20 minutes till you can ask your question about it. Like, that's just, that's not the best way to spend time, I don't think. Um, I much prefer the, um, either going to business meetings for the, the the country and affinity groups, which I think have, they have real value to them. Um, and then, you know, mentoring things or mixers, there's graduate student receptions. Also, like, Getsy, which brings you all here today, is going to have the, uh, we're going to have some buttons so you can get to know people. Like go to, if we find a little moment where we can all get together, which is part of the plan, you, come talk to us then. That's an opportunity. I'll be there. We can say hello. That That's that's the the, the type of chance to like really learn something or to have the, those, those interactions that you're looking for. And I think they're more, that stuff is generally more valuable um, than just sitting and passively consuming research. Although, you know, it could be every year there's like one panel that things really go crazy or get really exciting or you can't believe who who said what to somebody else or somebody delivers a contentious paper. And you'd love to have been in the room for that, but you can, if you knew what, what that was going to be in advance, you wouldn't have to ask the question in the first place. Thank you. That's really helpful. Because I thought the same thing, but I was afraid it was disrespectful to think I'm like, but I could read their paper. And so... <laughs> I absolutely, I mean, the reason why political scientists are such a ridiculous crowd at our uh, convention is that nobody, like people go to their own panel only. And so the 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 modal number of people in the audience is zero. Right? We're just reading papers to each other in Toronto or whatever. <laughs> like, it doesn't have to be that way. One thing, Nita, that, that 
I, I almost thought you were going to ask and that some people try to do is that they find like individual papers that they're really, in, you know, they want to go see or they want to see this like person they've heard about or something. And so they hop panels, they like sit at the back and then like after a paper or so, then they hop out to another panel and then hop and, and you can do it. But I will say that it gets um, like, like it's kind of like multitasking where you think you're being really efficient and like, you know, getting all this in, but the experience is actually a lot less satisfactory because you're just like, you're, you're almost like running yourself too ragged and you're not like allowing things to kind of percolate and connect. And so sometimes even if you don't think you're going to be interested in the rest of the things on a panel, it's sometimes actually quite valuable, even just to see what a discussant does to connect the dots about like how the papers talk to each other or, you know, there's things that kind of come out of some of that time where you're like afraid you'll be bored. Um, so just, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's an absolute no, no, people do it, but um but I wouldn't do it too often. That would be how I would, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I feel the same way. That is that is the right advice. Um, I tend to try to avoid that uh, because I don't want to be. I don't want to convey to people inadvertently that I was not here to. I was not at that paper at that panel to hear their paper. Right. That's the thing that's. It, it can be tricky. But also, we can all remember that everybody's doing the best they can with a limited amount of time and everybody's very busy. And so you got to do what you got to do. And we don't have to blame anybody or we don't have to get too upset about it. And if you're late, still go. Like, yeah. like everybody's just, you know, like there's so much going on that nobody's going to hold it against you if you're like sneaking into the room at a certain point. You made it. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, unless there are any late breaking questions, I think we'll start to wrap up. Um, I That's really, yeah, I really appreciate, this has been a great conversation. I think it really helped put a more of like a human and humane sense of what the conference is all about. Um, so thank you all for asking questions, Tom and Tamora for your wisdom and experience. Um, uh, just to put the plug in, yes, Getsy will be like out and about trying to make itself known um, and explicitly for uh, grad students who are attending for the first time or just want to get to know what Getsy's up to, uh, we'll be trying to make space and time for that. So please find us. And um, I'm really looking forward to AAS now more so than before. So thank you everyone for coming. Nice to see you all. And if you're there, introduce yourself. I'm like this in real life too. It's nice to pre-meet some people. <laughs> yeah, right? I'll remember all your names and then uh, uh, just come say hello. <laughs> <laughs>